Welcome everyone and thank you for joining Double Radius as we host today's webinar with Redline entitled TV White Space Achieving Excellent Long Range non site Connectivity. My name is Chad Crossland. I'm the marketing manager here at Double Radius. For those who are new to Double Radius, we are a value-added distributor of wireless network solutions. And since 2001, we've been helping service providers, systems integrators, municipalities, telcos, and others to build better networks. We've got two locations, our headquarters here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and our facility in Salt Lake City, Utah. And now that I've introduced myself and Double Radius, I'd like to introduce our two guest speakers for today. First is Dennis Lambert from Redline Communications, a leading TV white space equipment manufacturer that has been working in partnership with Microsoft for over two years on TV white space technology. Dennis is with Redline's business development group, where he's responsible for all things TV white space globally, as well as their CBRS strategies within the service provider market. Dennis has been with Redline for 13 years in various functions, so always tied to mining and service provider markets. And along with Chris Wired, his technical counterpart, they've they're some of the best field, um, they've got some of the best field experience in TV white space really of any vendor. And I'd like to give a special thanks to Dennis because along with about a half a million other people in the Montreal area for the last 24 hours, they have been without power. So real special thanks uh, for Dennis for being a trooper, for being here, and hopefully everybody will get their power up shortly. Uh, second speaker I'd like to introduce is Hannah Webb. Hannah is the Business Development Director of Emerging Technology for Nominet, where she's been focused on supporting dynamic spectrum management growth in the U.S. And for those who don't know, Nominet provides the database element of the ecosystem, which is required by the FCC to dynamically allocate the TV white space spectrum. And this is an important part of the equation that Hannah will go into more in her presentation. So just a little more housekeeping before we start. Throughout the presentation, if you have any questions on the material, please enter them in the questions box so we can address those questions at the end of the webinar. And then after the Q&A, please just hang in just a minute longer so you can complete the survey that will appear on your screen. And with that, I'll turn it over now to Dennis Lambert from Redline Communications to get us started. Thank you very much, Chad. Uh, hello, everybody. I, I appreciate that, that while you're on mute, you can't respond, but uh, really happy to be here. It's been uh, it's been an exciting uh, beginning of year, and Double Radius has been leading a charge to to really push the frontier out of the SAT service uh, with with TV white space. So I'll go. There, the, there's a lot of material uh, that we're going to try and go through today. Uh, I will skip a number of slides. I don't necessarily. I want you to have a quick look at them because they will be part of the follow up material that you'll be getting. So at least you'll have an introduction to some of those concepts. Uh, I will try to spend most possible time on uh, on TV white space. That is the topic of today. So without any further ado, uh, let's do it first. Because we are, Redline is um, an IS Net World certified organization, and that implies that we have mandatorily to take some uh, um, some basic warning and, and caution. So if you're driving, uh, hopefully you've got something wireless to to uh, to listen to the audio and you're not holding a phone. Uh, make sure that wherever you are, you are familiar with the exit strategies uh, of the building and not the organization. And uh, make sure that you know who are the first aid person responsible in your environment. Um, other piece, well, this is all, some of the obvious, so I'll skip that one really fast. Redline's a, an equipment vendor. We've been around the block since 99. We, uh, we've got offices in about 12 countries. We're publicly traded. Um, a lot of people have heard of us, uh, some not. I must admit that our marketing may not be the strongest uh, point to Redline. We operate in three distinct markets, industrial, government, and telecom, which is the focus of today. Uh, in the end, if you look at the application we deliver in all these markets, it all comes down to uh, high capacity, high predictability, multi-point type environment. So there's common denominator to all of these three different markets. We do offer a complete solution of, of platform, and I will have, after, after we're done talking to TV White Space, I'll probably introduce some of those products. I'll skip some extremely fast, but they will be part of the deck that you will receive uh, thereafter. Uh, what the last point? We are by default an engineering company, uh, so everything we do is our own DNA, and that's uh, that's exact. Uh, that's exactly why 
we're able to deliver what you know specific performance for market, really targeted feature types. Uh, we control all parts of the DNAs of our radios, and our goal is not to be the price leader, but the ROI leader, delivering a product that you never have to drive back to. Doesn't matter the consideration. In a conventional network, we carry multiple facets, but we also cover most of the parts of network. So we do have a full core uh, network solutions between NMS and EPC in the LTE space. Uh, we do a virtual fiber, which we're going to talk for uh, TV white space today, plays into the, what we'll define as the transport part of the network. So it's either point to point, multi point. It can be an end device. It can be a, a, a point to reach Wi-Fi thereafter, which in, in which is what we do a lot in the industrial space. And if you think about that, the service provider is no different. You deliver a, a point of presence or point of, to a customer, and then they're on. They deliver Wi-Fi. So at the end of our radio, there's usually another network. We also have a full LTE 3GPP solution, and we'll briefly brush on them. And then, last but not least, CPEs and some UE device specific to the LTE market. So, in the transport parts of the world, uh, what we actually had uh, focus on is bridging that gap. Bridging that gap between where fixed network end and where application may reside. In the telecom space, all of you being service provider are quite familiar with the concept that we're bridging the digital divide. That's what you do every day of your life. And that, that is something key to our model and to our market. So our fit into the space plays very nicely. We, uh, we originally came out, for those who've been in the industry long enough, we originally came out as a, as a vendor in the service provider market with our very first product way back when, a lot. I was about to say most, but a lot of the service provider were basically orthodont or redline backhaul, and it was either Canopy or Alvarian uh, access. So we, we've known that industry for a long time. We were an active player in the WiMAX space. The last five or six years, our offering to the residential access was somewhat less limited, but we were still very active in the business-to-business -business application. And then there was TV white space. Um, that came to us for a military application uh, about five years ago. We worked hard in the last five years in making it accessible. So though a lot of you probably have heard of Redline TV White Space a few years ago, and, and the one thing that would come to mind was be completely unaccessible uh, financially wise. It was just no way anybody could afford a $3,000 CP on a house, and, and I absolutely believe you. So we've worked uh, really hard at making, at taking the military piece of technology that we had and bringing it down to a residential and commercial part. Uh, and with uh, the folks at Microsoft, we've done uh, the last piece of that effort last year when we signed an agreement with them. I'll talk a bit about it, but it doesn't imply any money. It implies uh, us committing to volume production and Microsoft making far more noise so we could help move those products. So fundamentally, TV white space is not really new. We're going to go through in the next few slides some of the, the relevance of TV white space in your portfolio, some of the band basic rules. We're going to talk, Hannah is going to talk about database and what it does and how it plays. And then we're going to go through some products. So the image here is interesting. Uh, if you've ever seen a TV white space or UHF sector, that's what it looks like. So it is about close to four feet tall, five feet tall. It's, it, it is, UHF is a low frequency, so antennas tend to be bigger or the gain. The reason why TV white space has been extremely visible in the last year and a half, really hard uh, with those bullets in the mid, mid part of the page, with the perfect storm, I'll call it. So basically, a lot of partnership between uh, Redline and Microsoft to drive the price down, where our CPE under the Airband product uh, program, for those who are on the Airband program, you've seen that the CPE price has, done, has, been, has gone down dramatically. At the same time, we've seen the last two years a very strong resurgence between CAF1, CAF2, and a bunch of, of uh, 
regional program and state program. Big resurgence in rural funding and some changes in that rural funding, specifically with the GAF programs where a higher percentage of census had to be reached. So that really implied that for the last 10 years, you know, funding has been done, but we all know that a lot of the HARA and the REST uh, funding and the BTOP funding the, from years past, the vast majority went to middle mile and, and providing more fiber infrastructure to, to the big guys and the big carriers. While the, those who did not have connection, well, kind of left behind a bit. So that has changed a lot in the last few years in the way uh, the federal changes its funding arrangement. The, the other part is FCC mandating 25 meg as a minimum, 25.3 as the standard for, for, uh, for broadband. So that actually implies that while there were a lot of ISM solutions, and there, it'd be easy to make a, a very high capacity ISM 900 solution with only 26 megahertz spectrum. It's just quite challenging to build an infrastructure uh, and, and a network wide solution with re literally reuse of one. So, in that respect, TV wide space is the only sub one gig band with enough spectrum where you can build a network. It is uh, challenging because of. of uh, broadcast industry and we're going to talk about that and Anna's going to help us through but the reality is the further out you are the more rural you are the better the band behaves because obviously there's less broadcasters so that is absolutely key um, this is the census image and there's been a number of, of discussion of as to how accurate those census and those uh, broadband access are um, Microsoft has continuously fought for the, to the FCC to define that it, it is not anywhere close to where it is. The, and the fundamental part of why Microsoft is fighting it is really with those main drivers. It's not just rural, residential. Of course, your house is important if you're in the rural, but the reality is also health, it's also education. In the rural space, for the most part, you're going to find agricultural environment. You're going to call, find remote industries. And in order to survive in the 21st centuries, all of that need to have access to high capacity. In, in, in 2019, that a school has very limited or even no access to internet seems to make no sense, uh, yet it still exists. So that is what all of the efforts are to be reaching those who are still not connected. So Everything we're going to talk in, in TV white space is ultimately the tool right now uh, based on spectrum access and based on, on, on technology to push out the frontier where satellite service is the only option. So that bit of an introduction to what the point of the Microsoft Airband program is. So if you've, uh, if you've been to a Microsoft presentation, what you're going to realize is what the the strength of the airband organization. And there's a reason they're based in Washington, and there's a reason why their management is all former FCC lawyers, is the biggest part that Microsoft brings to the industry is a very strong policy influence with the regulator. They, they know how to talk the language of policymakers in Washington. They know how to navigate the FCC, and, and slowly but surely, they are getting some wins for us. They just won a few things that we're going to talk to when we're going to talk about the rules, but they've, there's a few wins that they've got for us. Higher, higher elevation, less restriction on power. Uh, so it, it, it does take time. The broadcast industry, the NEB, uh, is, is quite a, a powerful lobby. But with Microsoft, the largest software vendor in the world, it's, it's unusual for our industry, the service provider industry, to have such a strong ally. So they do put some money in, in, in some projects, that's true, but more importantly, they, uh, they bring visibility to an industry that dramatically needs it, considering that we're the only industry that's pushing the, the border of connectivity. So our part to this is to provide, as Redline, is to provide a unique CapEx, OpEx structure worldwide where, where we can say anywhere in the world, the base price of equipment, if you're an Airband member, is gonna be identical. So there's no 
favoritism, if you may. Um, and we adjust different parts of the OPEX based on regulatory and requirements locally. So in the U.S., it's fully defined, it's fully clear. Uh, and if you're an Air Band member, you do have all of this. Our part doesn't stop at just a product. The reality is there's still a lot of stuff around that band that people are not aware of or not used to. Um, this is the only frequency that you play with where you may get to compete with somebody that's a thousand feet off the ground with 50,000 watts of power. That could be extremely destructive to your signal. So the, the, in dealing with the broadcast industry, it's pretty much, you know, we've shared bands between ourselves, between service provider before. We've shared the 900 with uh, garage door opener, baby monitors, tons of IOTs from the utilities lately. But all of these people had equal or less power than, than our industry. Here, we are, this, we are this small baby monitor. The broadcast industry could be massive. So if you don't pay attention, if you don't do this right, it could be challenging. So in order to help you ramp up and gear up, uh, under the, the, we've created a lot of programs and a lot of material under the Airband Partner uh, umbrella. So we do have a, a, an Airband Partner page. This material, a lot of this material is available as well to everybody else uh, that is not, is not an Airband member. Uh, but we do have a TV white space guide that's been, uh, that keeps evolving every, seems like every other week we had some, some new tips, some new finding, uh, or some new third party antenna product that we've identified that work. We have created a full down to the IP address test plan so people can get a couple of radios because it's not line of sight. There is no one desktop analysis. That'll be enough. You will have to test. So since you're getting a radio that you may not know, we've decided to give a full test plan ready bake with with the uploadable configuration files for the radio. And you can just follow the procedure, get you off the crowd fast. If we also have a number of online training video for help configuration, uh, help understand the band, and help understand the different parts. And as well as links to uh, our CBRS uh, strategies because you know, between CBRS and UHF or UHF and CBRS, these are likely the two bands that will be dominant in the service provider for the next few years. Additionally, since hearing from vendor is one thing, but hearing from counterpart is usually much better, uh, we also have an open discussion group on Facebook that you're more than ha more than we're more than happy to to have everybody else. It is closed group, so you do need to apply, send your name, company information, and then you know the door will be open. Uh, it started uh, late last fall. It had a bit of a hiatus early this year, but in the last month we went from about 250 members to uh, just shy of 400, and it keeps growing. Also would direct you in terms of uh, tools to the website page under the Redline University. There's plenty of, uh, of online training material as well as course description. And new for next week in terms of, uh, of, of support to people coming into the band, uh, we're going to start on Monday, um, 5 o'clock Eastern time next week, an open mic Monday. Basically, it's a web session somewhat like this. Uh, where you mute yourself if you're not talking, but otherwise you can ask away anything, uh, anything related to TV white space or CBRS. It's been, uh, there's been a number of requests from people from Facebook and from the, from, to have a conversation with, with somebody that has done this before. So we'll start this next Monday. It was officially started yesterday, but there was a mistake in the phone number. So sorry for that if, if one of you attended. Now, the, uh, there's been rule change, and you've heard about that. So TV white space, unlike every other band that you've used, uh, is, uh, is two very different things. It is a Part 15 band, so the ruling is out there, 99a1.pdf. Um, it's not a it's not a hot link in the in the document you will receive, but you can just Google this. I would strongly advise you to look and review the document. 
at the end of the day, any information I can provide you, I will gladly do. But if you're caught doing something erroneous, uh, you get the penalty from the FCC and not me. So in your best interest, uh, don't trust anyone. Do it for yourself. Have a look at this. You'll you'll understand some of the uh, some of the gotchas of the band. It does introduce something we've not seen yet: the power spectrum density, and uh, and this somewhat overtakes every other element of conventional uh, band definition. So yes, there are ERP of four watts and ten watts, and there are some TV channels that you can use that are either four or ten watts. So depending on the channel you choose, you may have different power allocation. Um, you need to be careful with this, but more importantly, there is a new concept of power spectrum density that, that somehow plays into this. That means that depending on how far you are from a broadcaster, how high you are from the ground, you may have to adjust your powers in, in a plenty of <laughs> different ways. And that can be extremely tricky, but, but there's an easy way out and we'll get to this uh, in about two slides. The other part uh, is we're not used to having restriction on antenna height. And it used to be 30 meter. Legally, it still is. But uh, while we were at Wisp America, FCC released some documents stating that there's going to be rule change. It's not in effect yet. But typically, when they announce rule change, it's pretty much concrete. It's just a matter of these rules being ratified and turned into regulation. So we will now be able to go up to 100 meter above ground uh, for antennas, which is a, is a significant change. And the biggest impact of this change is literally so you can use water towers and you can use a lot of common infrastructure that were up until now pretty much barred. Uh, because if you look at the average that water tower of about 120 feet, well, if you're, if you're no, no more than 100 feet allowed, and that means you either need to have a fancy installation for power on the leg of the tower, or you're really on the bolt, which just doesn't make sense because it becomes extremely costly. So by being able to go all the way to 100 meter, then you can actually go install on top of, of tall crane elevators, uh, silos, water towers, and other infrastructure ready built. So that's extremely helpful. You will have to be extremely careful that higher is not always better. Uh, first, uh, that is actually the first lesson in the TV white space guidance document. The higher you go, the more sensitive you are to received interference from a broadcaster far away. So you have to be careful with elevation. Other rule that has not changed is you're still no longer allowed to go more than 250 meters at uh, above average terrain height. So for all of you, that may be in the Appalachian, that may be in the, the Rockies. You have to be careful. We, uh, we did a pilot not too long ago in Colorado, and uh, once we climbed the mountain, we realized that they would have had to dug, dig a hole about 20 feet deep to put our tent because it was beautiful. First range of mountain overlooking the plains, but that first range of mountain was just way too high. So this 250 meter uh, above average terrain, you have to be careful about that. Uh, but again, there's easy way to do this. Last but not least, uh, there was uh, um, the, the, the previous rule allowed for uh, professional installation of CPE, and, and every device needed to have uh, lat long definition as well as elevation. It is part of the rule. Every single radio needs to have uh, in, in its definition and programming lat long and elevation. It's quite possible that the new rule introduced the, the, the requirements for automatic for geolocation of those devices, i.e., uh, building in uh, some well, some form of GPS for for a lack of better terminology. So it's actually something we are we're already considering for ease of installation. Um, there's a lot of people if if uh, if you have radios, remote radios that can find out their own lat long elevation then it's one step closer to self-installation, which is also part of the roadmap uh, for the next few months. And, and I'll talk about that briefly later. So you got to be careful about the power you put. You have to be extremely careful about the height you go at. And depending on where you are, you need to recalculate what you're allowed to do for power. 
you need to pay attention to what TV channels are because some are allowed 4 watts and some are allowed 10 watts. But very luckily, we've got Nominet and the database does all of this stuff for you. So we're gonna, I'm going to transfer slowly over to Nominet. We're going to have uh, and, and, uh, and Anna Webb, the director of uh, technology development at uh, Nominet, will now take the stage. Anna, if you're willing, I'll put your slide up. And then we're going to have a demonstration. And, and, and I do want to appreciate Anna's presence. Uh, she is in the UK right now, so it's well after dinner time for her. So she's here for us, and, and uh, she's going to share a lot of good information about the database. Over to you, Hannah. Thanks, Dennis. So then thank you to the Double Radius guys as well. Thanks, Chad, for, for having um, having me on. So um, as, as Dennis said, Nominet's role in TV white space is, is on the database side. So just to give you a bit of a background to Nominet and uh, why we are in uh, the database space and why we're in, in TV white space, uh, Nominet's core business is we run .uk, so for the last 20 years we've been uh, in domain name registry. Uh, we've recently got into cyber security as well. Uh, we run cyber uh, security at DNS level. Um, and then the team that I work within is the emerging technology team. Uh, for about the last eight years we've been working uh, in TV white space and looking at spectrum sharing and advocating spectrum sharing. Um, so we're, we're also looking at CBRS as well uh, and looking at providing a SAS uh, CBRS. Uh, but the initial work in, in dynamic spectrum management has been in TV white space. Uh, so part of the advocating we've been doing is, is really we think that um, spectrum is a finite resource and, and it could be used much more efficiently to, to provide uh, better connectivity and enable connectivity, um, certainly in those rural areas where, where users don't, don't have uh, good broadband connectivity. Um, part of the key role of the database um, is protecting the incumbents, and, and I'll give you a demo of, of the tool we've got in, in a minute just to, to show you how important it is to protect the incumbents. Uh, the TV white space band is the, where the TV broadcasters aren't using the spectrum, uh, but, but a key part of the regulation and the enforcement of the regulation is to make sure uh, that we protect those incumbent users. So we've worked closely with NAB um, to, to make sure we're aligned with, uh, with their request, but also uh, we went through an 18-month process with the FCC uh, to build our database and made sure that all of um, all of our database and everything we were regulating was in line with what they they required. Uh, so Dennis mentioned it earlier: you can't use TV white space um, unless you're using a database. It is part of the regulation, and the, the the importance of that is that you can use the spectrum that is available and also use it at the power limits that are required. Uh, so part of the tool that Nominet have developed is called WayDB. Uh, there's a number of platforms that you can use if you are deploying TV white space. Uh, but the initial tool that I, I want to show you is WayDB Explore. Uh, this is something that Nominet initially developed as an, uh, an internal tool. We used it to demonstrate how TV white space can be used and also to do um, some checks on channel availability before actually going out into the field and supporting some of our partners. Uh, in the last three months, it's actually something that we've commercialized, so um, if required, we find that WISP and network operators can actually subscribe to the service to support in their planning of, um, of TV white space. So let me just share my screen now with you. So as I mentioned, this is what you did with Explore, so it's a, a login, uh, something that you can subscribe to. Um, what really it's there to do is to support your planning. Uh, it's not designed as a planning tool, it's designed as something that you can use to support your planning, so you can potentially use other tools or work with, uh, with the likes of Redline to support in your planning. But really it's as simple as finding a location on a map. Um, you can either do this by uh, using the last and long, putting the address in, or actually just finding a location uh, on the map. You'll see this that particular area I've, uh, I've selected here. You've got all these icons here. This is the uh, TV broadcasters and um, so all of these locations here I mentioned that the key thing is to protect the incumbents so all of these locations here are, are where the TV broadcasters are what we can do is actually select these we can check uh, the call sign of them we can see which channels they are transmitting over um, and also check things like the coverage of that particular tower uh, and also the contour and this is important to make sure we understand if you're looking at deploying TV white space in this particular area that you can uh, understand 
what TV broadcasters in the uh, in the area are transmitting at, and, and how that coverage may affect your your deployment. So, if you want to actually select uh, or check the um, channel availability at a particular location, we've got this toolbar on the side. So, actually, you can just select the icon on the top left and drag and drop that anywhere you want to, um, and you'll see you get you get this histogram along the bottom. Um, so, you've got the maximum EIRP power here. Um, everywhere there's blue, it shows that there is channel availability. If you move this across um, any different locations in the US, you'll see how the power limits change and the channel availability will change per location. So, for exam example, channel 19 here, um, I can get up to 36 dBm. If I was to use uh, channel 37, you'll see for, for whatever reason, that particular location, the power limits are, are reduced. Once you select a channel, you can also get a rough coverage plot. Um, and this is designed, this is using the longly rise propagation model. So it gives you a rough idea as to actually from, uh, from that particular base station, uh, what, what coverage area you could get. Uh, and then you can start to build out your network. So I've added the, the yellow um, icon is um, a, an example of a client device. And I can also select this icon in the, in the center here and I'll get uh, an indication of the link budget. So you get a rough indication of the um, SNR, which helps also in your calculations and understanding what, uh, what your networks uh, may, uh, may look like. Uh, you can build multiple networks as well. So you see it's got the two blue icons, the two examples of base stations. So you either can compare side by side different networks um, or also look at um, different deployments that you may want to do um, if required and see how that may change. Uh, if required as well, I know Dennis has mentioned different height and uh, the height implications. Higher isn't always better, but uh, it's something you can also amend uh, on this uh, in this toolbar here just to see how the height may affect the power limits, but also gives you a rough coverage plot. At the moment, the hardware is selected as generic TV white space device. Uh, there is something that we will, we will enable in the future uh, releases, which will allow you to click on there and select which red line equipment you're using. Uh, and then all of the calculations will, will be inputted, uh, so you'll get uh, coverage plots based on the, the particular equipment you're using, and, and if you're bonding certain channels as well, that will allow you to allow you to do that. So the save function, so if you want to save certain scenarios, if you're looking at particular areas that you may want to deploy uh, TV white space or certain customers you're looking to, to, to support, you can save those functions. Um, as well as load also different functions as well if uh, once you've saved them. Part of using TV white space, and I know Dennis mentioned earlier as well, is looking at the terrain. I think terrain is key um, and it's important to understand if you've got an online of site how the terrain may affect um, what, um, what you're trying to deploy. Um, there's a terrain profiler icon as well on the side so you can actually see here by just dropping two points you get an idea of what the, what the terrain is in that location. The data at the moment doesn't actually take into account cluster. So we use the longly rise propagation model to, to calculate uh, details on the uh, coverage plot. Uh, but you can also down here, you can select to change uh, the atlas or you can change it to um, from atlas to either white or to the satellite to give you an idea of what cluster you may need to take into account. An additional overlay that we've added is the uh, market data overlay. We've included things like population um, to allow you to, to potentially target certain customers. Part of the key thing is providing rural connectivity. Um, so you can also select, we know the FCC's uh, regulation and they're stating that 25 megabits per second is, uh, is what they're requiring. So if I select on the icon that I need 25 megabits per second, uh, basically we get an overlay of all of the customers uh, in certain areas. If you hover over the areas as well, you'll get a breakdown of the population in those particular locations that uh, don't have 25 megabits per second. So it allows you to target those certain areas and, um, and also how, how TV white space could be used in those particular locations. You'll see here, this is where I zoomed in slightly closer and it gives you an idea down to the census block of the population you could potentially target um, using TV white space. Uh, so before I hand back over to Dennis, I mentioned WaveDB Explore, so it's a subscription service. There is a uh, 1499 per annum to subscribe to. 
Um, we have a, uh, an exclusive voucher for the double radius and red line webinar. Uh, it should be going around later, but if you use uh, log into welcome.wavedb.com and use the code 200 double radius April 19, you'll be able to get $200 off your, um, your subscription. If you've got any questions, I think my, my details will be up afterwards. But yes, please, please let me know if you've got any queries on, on the database. But I will hand back over to Dennis now. Thank you very much, Anna. Let me, uh, and I'll start back at, uh, at your slide on the role of the database, because I think this is important for people to, you've mentioned the role through your presentation, but I think it's important that uh, it, it's people understanding schematically how it plays. So basically, the, the role of the database is first and foremost, enable you to get access to the internet, which in this band, was completely prohibited, obviously, before uh, such a thing as a such a database would be. UHF is actually the very first fully shared band in the States, and it's shared between, obviously, a lot of the, the wireless microphone, most importantly, the broadcast industry, and obviously the, the license exempt part 15 for the service provider. So the goal of the database, uh, and, and Nominet does a fantastic job at making it far more than what it is, because uh, the first role of the database is to protect the incumbent. It's not to help you uh, sell more radio. It's really to protect the TV station. What Anna went through allows you to do, far, you know, allows you to do a better job at that. Uh, and that's beyond the way DP explores those beyond the requirements of the FCC. And uh, she did point out that you could play with elevation, see what channels are available, let's say at 40 feet, at 60 feet, at 70 feet. And that's something you'll get to do. Uh, on, on a number of the deployments because you want to play with elevation. It's part of the guidance as well, the manual that you can read, but you'll have to, to learn to uh, domesticate this band, for a lack of a better word. Uh, it is, imagine back 20-something years ago when 900 came out first and the idea of non-line of sight was reasonably new. So you literally had to experiment to understand its limitation, its capacity, and how it can help you run the business. Uh, you're going to do the same thing now with TV white space. You're going to have to understand, you know, where the database can help, what, how to deal with the, with the obstruction and the interference from the broadcasters, and, and where, how can you monetize this band. So the nominate application uh, beyond the database is a very serious tool for doing this. So I do encourage you to look at it because out of experience, it's been worthwhile. That being said, there's a lot of things in there. But how does that impact you installing a radio? Well, that's about how this is all it impacts. And all the database work is so it is extremely simple to configure the radio. It is a license exam band. So what you'll do is you'll do the same thing you do with any other license exam band. You're going to run a spectrum sweep you know, on the tower to find out what channel you should use. And I'm not talking TV channel here. I'm really talking to RF channel. So the radio has a spectrum sweep tool that allows you to, to, to listen to the whole wide, uh, whole wide spectrum and understand where the noise are. So just like you do with any other band, you're going to run the sweep, find out what are the preferable areas of the band for you to operate, you know, where there's less noise. And then the only difference is you're going to overlay this with the actual TV channel that are available for you. So that is the only additional step you have to do compared to 5.8 or 2.4 or anything else. Run the normal sweep that you would do, identify the frequencies that are best for you based on noise level and, and, and spacing, I guess, how wide you want a channel to run. And then you overlay this with a TV channel. The radio will present. The radio is connected to the database, so you don't have to do anything. It, it's, it points to the database, and it tells you in red what you're not allowed to do, in black what you can do, so the channel that you can use, and then the red is actually, in this case, the red, uh, sorry, the green is the channel that's being used in the screenshot. So if you want to use one TV channel, six megahertz, you click on, you can click on 14. If you want to have, to the TV channel wide in, in, uh, from a radio perspective, 
or you find a place where there are two contiguous, in this case, plenty thereof, and you click 14 and 15. So if you want three, you click 14, 15, 16, and if you want four, you click 14, 16, 17. They need to be contiguous, so they'll be channel bonded. So that, that's all from, a, the, from the whole process of the FCC. Once you get to the field, that's the only thing you have to do additionally. So find the frequency you want to play with, match that to the TV channel that are available, click on which one you want. They have to be contiguous up to four and you're done. So the, everything else in terms of calculation, the ERP, the, the, the height is going to be controlled by, well, the height is not controlled by the database, but if you try to install above limit height, the database will just block all everything. We'll just all be read. So this is where the, the database provides some policy as well for, uh, for, uh, for the FCC. So you, if you try to install too high, you're not going to have anything available. If you try to get too much power, it's not going to be available. And once you set to the power, when you get to the power, you choose your channel, it will tell you what power you're allowed to use. So it, it makes it extremely simple. Uh, it is quite automated process. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be some questions around that. So make the, I'll uh, speed up for the rest. This is, uh, now we're going to talk product a bit. Uh, there's a whole lot of solution in the red light portfolio for commercial and industrial between the uh, fixed uh, proprietary uh, broadband, as we talk about for the RDL 3000 to 3GPP standard base, standard certified uh, LTE in uh, in FDD, so that you're kind of sub two gig type band, and uh, TDD, which is the, the above two gig band, so currently on CBRS 34, later this summer in band 41 and 42, uh, as well as uh, our own uh, core, full, uh, full core EPC, and, and uh, it is later in the presentation. I may not get to that part, but do check it out. Uh, it is a 3GPP core, full standard. We've interrupted with a bunch of different vendors. The one thing we do extremely well is we scale down, and that's not something people are, are usually take, take, uh, take pride of, but we scale down very nicely. So if you're looking at a Cisco EPC, it starts at 15,000 nodes. Uh, we, we start at about 100. Uh, so it's a very uh, interesting application. We do have uh, NMS called Clearview that supports our virtual fiber as well as LTE. And we do have a fantastic push to talk application uh, also in the slides may not get to I may not get all the way there. I've put them in the back, but they are in the deck uh, from a follow up perspective. We'll talk about virtual fiber and uh, it's a layer two environment supports multiple frequency. Um, virtual fiber has two products RDL 3000 and RDL 3100 and we call it virtual fiber for a simple reason. The objective of the radio is to provide fiber-like characterization of your high peak traffic. So everything in the radio is meant to move packets in one, under whatever possible condition so you can keep a very definite latency, you can keep uh, uh, jitters down to a minimum and, and really minimize the retransmission. So it, it's um, technically speaking, it is a loose derivative of 802.16. So it's not 802.11 type CSMA. It is a connection oriented environment. Every traffic flow, uplink and downlink, need to be fully characterized. This is where the online videos are helpful because for a lot of you, you may not have been too familiar with this type of an architecture. It works extremely well in noisy environments because it's not chatty. It, there's a scheduler that we can connect up to 120 devices and every one of them has their time slice. So if you if it's not my time slice to talk, I just shut up. Vice versa. If it's if I don't if it's not my time to receive, I don't listen to anything. So it, it's a very quiet protocol which works well in noisy environments. There's a whole suite of product. They all carry the same feature. We we're going to talk about this today, which is the enterprise space. The connect versions of the same radios are for the industrial space. They're ruggedized. We also have these guys here, ruggedized, as well as uh, FIPS 140.2 certified for the militaries and government agencies who require this. 
We have device that includes serial gateways, more more uh, switching ports, more uh, TCP ports for use uh, a lot in the um, actually a lot of utilities kind of like this because they have uh, they put these their PLCs and their SCADA device dump it all into one box and have a radio built in to push it back. It exists. Those last two products don't apply you to UHF simply because the antennas would be too big, but we do have self-tracking, self-acquiring and tracking system. Don't mind the busyness of the next slide. This slide is only to talk about one thing. All of this is RDL 3000. The different frequency we support, the different function, the different form factor, the security, the robustness, the, 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 the electrical feature, all of this is defined. Today, we're only talking about this in red, the Ellipse Space Station and TV and UHF, oops, sorry, I shouldn't have clicked, as well as the remote, the enterprise remote for TV, uh, TV white space or UHF. The reality is if you understand those two products, you really understand everything else, hence the Swiss Army knife in the back. The platform allows you to do point to point, point to multi-point in so many different bands in so many different form factor and application. So it actually, the objective is to cover probably 60% of the wireless needs. The common feature set of the radio, and I've put here the FCC. We have two platform, uh, two version of this radio. Uh, current inventory still carries uh, what we call the Etsy, and I'll talk about the nuance, but going forward, it's gonna be the FCC version. The nuance with the current inventory is that the current inventory, while it lasts, you should take it, actually goes to 698. So it goes from 470 to 698 because that was the conventional band for the US. But since uh, the upper part has been auctioned off, there's really no purpose to, uh, to go in there. So the radio now supports all the way to uh, channel 37 and no further because it belongs to T-Mobile. Uh, and that other version is going to be uh, not, it's faded off the U.S. market, but it remains as what we'll call the Etsy version. So the radio know how to do all these different modulations from VPSK to QAM256, 7 over 8, and transmit and receive. And that's important because in a number of instances, we will get QAM256 and the receive. But the QAM256 was really introduced for the line of sight band in, in 3 and 5 gig. Given that it's the same architecture, everybody takes the benefit of this. Uh, at the same time, and we don't spend too much time here on MIMO, but this radio probably has the best MIMO way, and this is where we, we tend to shine. We don't reinvent um, the physics of, of UHF. If you played with any UHF radio, and you've had, you know, neg 70 noise level, and, and it's not going to change because you're changing brand. The physics is the same. We tell people, if you have past experience, tell us the RF environment, and we'll tell you what we can do for capacity, because we can't change the RF environment. But we can move more packets per second in any given modulation, because it's because our MIMO A supports MRRC received, SDBC transmit, and we can get MIMO gain all the way up to 9, 10, and 11 dB, which really at this stage, nobody else is even close to. Power is, combined power is 26 dB. Now, these are radio spec. Under FCC rule, uh, you're allowed to use 21 uh, dB per chain. Uh, so that's uh, probably coming into 20, it would be counted as 24 uh, or something like that combined. So, you know, there's, with this radio, as with anything else, there's what the radio does, and then there's the, the feature set that's allowed by regulator. What that gives you, though, on a 20 megahertz channel with a cyclic prefix of 1A, remember, it is a derivative of 802.16, so we have a cyclic prefix or CP uh, factor. At top capacity, the radio will deliver 9.3 bits. Now, you may want to make, make a note of one thing that's... Uh, I think it's not in the presentation, but oh, actually, well, yes, it is on the next slide, so I won't, I won't do it. Um, it is wire speed. It's a 100 meg to Oh, sorry, I should do. Uh, it's a wire speed, and uh, it's. You know, 2.3 AT power over Ethernet. So any standard 
Ethernet switch will support it. If a radio is rated, to, is IP67 rated to cold start at minus 40, operates to all the way to plus 60. So it's an extremely robust platform. Um, and I was about to say earlier that this is an important thing for all of you uh, technical people. The, uh, it is an extremely efficient radio. At, at QAM256, on a, uh, we carry 9.3 bits per hertz. We carry 6.5 bits per hertz at QAM64, and I apologize for the typo here, and 4.5 bits per hertz at QAM16. So while you're trying to do, we get a lot of QAM256 downlink, and we, let, we get a lot of QAM64 type capacity uplink uh, once we're doing network design. That being said, the capacity you're always going to get in UHF, regardless of the brand, is really related to the signal to noise spacing you're going to get. Uh, it's, it's, you, if, if, it's one thing to have a great receive, but if the noise level is at meg 75, then that's just what it is. And it's going to impact the signal to noise. So uh, that is extremely key to understand. We know how to do channelization from 875 kilohertz all the way to 20 meg. So that is the radio channelization. From an FCC perspective, if you overlay six megahertz TV channel, what that really means is that a one TV channel will be about will be a five meg channel to us. A two TV channel will be a ten meg channel to us. Three TV channel will be fourteen meg effectively in the radio, and four TV channel will effectively be a twenty meg radio channel. So this is and and this I know is confusing. All you have to remember is that this is 120. Here you get about 160 meg IP in line of sight. You get about 120 here, 80 here, and about 45 there in line of sight. The noise level, the level of obstruction is going to really define what else you're going to get in terms of real performance. Frequency reuse of two works. Frequency reuse of one, while the mats work, uh, the challenge is getting good enough antennas with VWSR and, and really, really high front to back ratio, which don't really exist at the price point from of the service provider market. Radio can operate in fixed frame or variable frame. If you all, if you're all by yourself, a single radio, single base station, uh, say you have one base station omni per pole and from village to village, variable frame works well. It maximizes the low latency. It maximizes the airtime. But as soon as you have more population of radio, you have to go to fixed frame because the radio can interfere themselves one another. Because of the 802.16 type design and really good filtering, we have an extremely good rejection of interference. The radio works extremely well in high interference environment. Um, there is no magic again. If there's high interference, you're going to get low performance. But we'll our low performance will be typically much higher than anybody else. I've already talked about the connection oriented. I've put an example here on the sheet of a typical link in UHF. Actually, this is a link budget tool that that red line has. It's available if you ask a DR. Uh, if you have your 20 dBp power, and the antenna size that you're going to get in this band are usually going to be either, or not size, but gate are 11 and 8 seems to be the two numbers that are most common. You're not going to see much more gain. Uh, simply because low frequency, there would be such a big antenna that it would make sense. So if I'm looking at optical line of sight, so optical line of sight uh, under uh, to red line is that I can eyeball the other side. I don't have any low Fresnel zone, but I can see my target. Uh, if I run a 20 meg channel, I'm and uh, if I'm trying, I've, I've built uh, some basic stuff. I didn't use Quantum 256 simply because I, I, I strongly believe that in non-line of sight, it's going to be, uh, you shouldn't count on that. It's, it's going to be a bonus when you get it. But at Quantum 64, you're going to get 120 meg uncoded bit rate, about 105 IP over five miles. So in line of sight, obviously, that would be much better. But just the idea of, of numbers. <laughs> the uh, I've talked about a lot of these things already, so I'm going to skip. It is kind of the deck. Uh, it is the modulation. I think what is uh, one thing that's been uh, presented to me before, and I didn't want to be able to, to say, is that 
the modulation is dynamically adaptive per CPE. So every single CPE out there connected to a single base station can have its own modulation, its own MIMO scheme, and the base station handles them one by one as it goes along. So what it do, what you get is extremely good performance. Um, again, screenshot here of one link that was about half a mile of non line of sight, and they were getting pretty much 50 meg up, 50 meg down. So of course I didn't put the link that does not work because you will get links that do not work. There, there's nothing to change anything. I've got a couple of slides before I go on to to, to the closing part. I've got a couple of slides. You get to review them at, at your leisure. We've qualified this radio extremely well. This is aggregate capacity, green, unidirectional capacity, downlink and uplink, based on the number of connections. So if you have like a point to point, one plus one, this is, you get top. And this is one plus five CP, so one sector, five CP, 10 CP, 15, 20, all the way up to 120, which is our maximum allocated number. So you're gonna see the power curve what a throughput curve does drop as you're heading people, but it drops extremely slowly all the way to the 20 and 40. You're still well above 140. So, and given that in TV white space, you're looking at, at picking up the stragglers, the average customers that we have probably sits between 15 and 25. So you're not gonna, there's very low impact on performance and capacity as you're heading people. Um, when another factor that's important is the failover. So assuming you have an overlay of uh, sector radio, assuming, if you lose one, even though it's connection oriented, we ran tests in, in lab and in the field up to 90 with uh, 90 customers. So it, it doesn't really, you're not going to have that for real life, but up to 90, it actually took 40 seconds for everyone to jump from one base station to another which is extremely good and in the number of IP application may be completely transparent. Wouldn't be for voice or streaming, but that is life. Um, the deck also talks about uh, the commercial form factor. So the, the, the industrial remote terminal, uh, some may be helpful to you if you're dealing with, uh, in, in your environment, if you're out west and you're dealing with energy, oil and gas, the Connect Siri is something that's commonly found same RF feature is just beefier product, better power protection, better you know integrated uh, lightning protection, protection against brownouts and and uh, and speak. Uh, the industrial, oh, sorry, be that the industrial in cabinet platform provides a dual DC input radio either built in or have an RJ45 jack for an outdoor radio couple of uh, you know, dry contact for door access uh, triggers uh, or gas low trigger for a alternative power, a couple of uh, ethernet ports all into a cabinet rated device. So it's not outdoor, but if it's, a, if it's in a cabinet, if it's not directly rating on, it'll take the abuse. Extremely uh, popular with the, uh, with the utilities, local utilities and power companies, because they can afford, they can do one device instead of multiple device in the cabinet. Uh, along with a DC power supply. And uh, I'll switch back to the screen, go through some of the other things. So we uh, do have a full EPC core that scales from about 100 to, to tens of thousands of devices. Um, it is extremely robust. It works extremely well. But more importantly, it can be remote. It can be as a service. But more importantly, it could be, so it could be centralized. It could be fully distributed. I have a hard time with my mouse. I truly apologize for that. Uh, it could be fully distributed. So uh, if you're, um, say you have organization in all counties under your jurisdiction that may want to have some mobile service under CDRS or fixed access, well, every county could be their own market. They could have their own EPC but yet you have the central authority a Patriot, our CDRS uh, product. It has, it's, a, it's a very interesting form factor, all outdoor integrated antennas, integrated radios. Um, you can actually use carrier aggregation or channel aggregation. So that by design, imagine that you have three radios and three antennas. So the radio one unit covers 180 degrees. 
as your customer density change, you can actually remove one or replace one of the channel edge and add it to a second antenna to have two can two channels, so possibly up to 40 meg, and obviously put literally three channels in the same antennas. So if you do this and you have four base station around the, the block, then you can have over in excess of 400 meg of capacity. So very interesting from a growth perspective, you put two out, you cover 360 degree, and then as density increase, you can replay with play with your radios. I like this, I've got a performance chart, but I really like most of my two guys here. Um, they're not your uncle nor, nor my grandpa. They're really businessmen. And you're going to get a lot of those guys in your markets. You're going to get a lot of agricultural, a lot of people who work um, in the field, literally, and still need mobile IP data um, because agricultural is a very serious business and, they, and everything needs to be connected like the rest of the world. So if you're using, if you're starting to deploy CBRS in a fixed man, in a fixed fashion, where we could have an integrated EPC in every single unit, but make it simple, the reality is the next move that you want to go is to start doing some mobile IP. And then a couple of years down the road, as ubiquitous coverage becomes more a reality in your world, then you can actually start doing something else and bring IP, whether it's a SID gateway or a standard IP. So that was our Patriot, our TDD LTE. Ellipse 4G is our FDD LTE for the sub two gig band, fundamentally. So extremely, uh, very, very robust product. This one actually has been uh, initiated a couple of years ago for, uh, for, the, for marine application, offshore application, as well as mining and oil and gas application. So that's why the box looks a bit more uh, robust. Uh, it is cold start to minus 55. You can drop it 10 feet high. It's not going to work. There's no mobile component. It's an extremely solid platform. And it works great from a rural perspective. Uh, we've used it in a number of our First Nation community because all as you're looking at it at 20 pounds, this is a full EOB, two times 10, 10 watt. <coughs> Sorry. All outdoor design will support uh, that's an older slide, sorry. The, the data is actually up to 256 connection right now. Question come up if you want. I'll flip back to the appropriate slides. So okay, thank you. There's a lot of material. Yeah, there's a lot of questions uh, that have come in already. I'm going to start going through and reading uh, the questions. And uh, almost everybody has stuck around to the end for the questions. So that's great. Hopefully, everyone will get the benefit of these questions being answered. Um, the first one is, will 900 megahertz perform the same as TV white space in a perfect environment? So I, I would say, uh, and I love this question because th this is the best analogy for TV white space. So what I've seen, and, and, it, and this is not about an engineering, this is just for, for me seeing it out in the field. I've been uh, playing with TV white space in the field and on pilots of customers. And, and what I have seen is that uh, in perfect line of sight, uh, TV white space will go a wee bit further uh, because it's 600 megahertz. So just from the physics, it's, a 50%, it's almost 50% lesser frequency, so it will carry a signal further, one. For sec uh, second of all, I guess, uh, unless you have one of the new uh, Cambium radio, you're not going to find too many solid MIMO radio in 900. So MIMO does that. So in perfect line of sight, MIMO B would would uh, would help, or MIMO A would get you ton more reach. Um, in real life, because right, that's none of these bands would be used in line of sight. If if you have line of sight, then you ain't gonna go to 900 or UHF. You're gonna go to two, three, and five gig. So in real world, what we've seen is. Uh, I, would, I always tell people, don't expect much more reach than 900. My eyes, 900 megahertz become very unstable at delivering a mega and a half. UHCV white space still delivers uh, 15 meg. I've seen this day in and day out, providing that your noise level is good. So it, it is partly because of lesser frequency, which carries better, as well as MIMO. So I think, as a rule, don't expect to go much further than unstable 900, but expect that you're going to get 15 plus mega at that place. 
So I don't know if that, hopefully that answered the question. Uh, feel free to, to feedback uh, if I'm if I've missed the spot or or not touched it properly. So I've seen anywhere from from half a mile to four and a half miles. It's, it, it, I, I, there is no one magic thing. I do invite you to uh, look up though on the uh, Redline Open Discussion Group on Facebook because those questions are commonly asked. And I got to say, the community is very kind into responding with what they have seen. So going through some of those threads may help you uh, get not the view from me, but the view from from your colleagues. Okay. Another question is: Is Spectrum available today? How do we acquire it? Just like two four uh, or or uh, or five gig license exam. The only twist is that the band is shared with other industries and because of that FCC mandates that there's a database to run who uses what and make sure protecting the, the broadcaster so there is a feature database because you know Anna and Aminet are, are do a super job but they're not a not-for-profit so they need to you know, everybody they need to make a living as well so it doesn't cost you anything to get the band the band has been readily available for five six years so people have been using if you don't even have there's no permission to ask. There's nothing. You just, it is a license free ban. The fee are, the only fee are tied to the fact that you know, there needs to be a database operator. All right. Another one is what suggestions do you have for how to explore partners to provide TV white space or other fixed wireless solutions in a rural community where no ISPs currently have TV white space deployed? Wow, that's a, actually, I think, uh, Chad, probably double radius may actually be a good place to start um, because they know all of the partners. Double radius works with some 2,500 service provider and other customers right across the country. So double radius, depending on where you are, double radius may actually be able to point you in the right direction. That's probably, I would say, the easiest way to go about that. Um, if, if you wanted, our emails are all at the bottom between Chad, Anna, Chad, and I. Uh, you can also drop us an email with where you are, and, and we'll try to connect you the best we can. But I think uh, with, with the market savvy that Double Radius has for the ISP markets, they could probably, uh, they're well equipped to help you out. And we'll definitely follow up with that uh, to get you some more information. Um, we have another question here. Are the policies for use uh, for TV white space, or what are the policies for use for TV white space in Canada? And is everything specific to the US and the FCC that was presented today? Canada is a bit of a, a different place. Uh, the, the rule are somewhat the same. Uh, so there is a database operator, Industry Canada back then, now called, I said, Industry Canada selected that had an RFP, there was a single responder sorry to say, and it turns out that they have a database that doesn't follow any of the standard database protocol. Hence, no vendor has, uh, has bothered uh, tying up to that database because that would be too much of an investment to reinvent the protocol to tie to database. There's a protocol called PAUSE, uh, literally standard, which literally means protocol, uh, let me see, PAUSE, protocol for accessing white space. And, uh, and uh, the organization uh, in Canada, the organization that was, uh, I guess, that one, that RFP in Canada, does not abide by pause. So I actually had a conversation with other TV white space based in Canada not so long ago. And, and I hate to say, uh, none of us are willing to invest you know, $150,000 for doing yet another protocol. So in the moment, there's, uh, I know of a number of people in Canada who are using TV white space, they are doing so under experimental license that uh, I said grants quite easily. Uh, I know that Anna and, and Nominet have made a lot of representation to I said in Canada to, to push for, for, uh, for the government to change its position on using a, another database that'd be more standard based, readily uh, chock full of vendors uh, certified. But for the moment, it's all experimental. There's a, uh, I do invite you to join, sorry, I, no plug again, but 
if you go to the uh, Red Line Open discussion group, there's a couple of guys from Canada. Or to say Canada is a bit of a standstill, even though we have a great expanse of land that could benefit from this. Okay. Yeah, I think we've, um, we're at about an hour and 15 minutes here. And uh, for the sake of time, we, uh, if there are any questions that remain unanswered, we will make sure to get back to those offline. Um, but I wanted to, at this time, uh, bring us into a conclusion here and thank uh, Dennis and Hannah for, for being here, as well as definitely the audience and all the people that have been a part of it. Um, there will be a recording, so uh, as well as um, we'll have more information again with those questions that might not have been answered. Uh, you can certainly ask us more questions. Uh, I can send those to sales at Double Radius. We'll be happy to, to answer those. If you could just take a quick moment to um, answer the survey that will appear on your screen. And uh, we appreciate everyone for being here today. And with that, we will catch you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you all for, for taking the time this afternoon.